all for coming this afternoon, since the sun is actually out, so I doubly appreciate it. Um, and um, so I just want to introduce myself, give some thanks to people who need to be thanked, and then I will introduce Lisa. Um, so I'm Anita Barini, I'm the Corning Professor in the Humanities here, and we've had an all-day session here on um, scientific environments and sustainability and biodiversity, and it's been really great. Thank you all for coming for our keynote talk at the end of the day. So there are several people that we need to thank for this. My co-organizer, Georgina Montgomery, Michigan State, sitting in the front here. I'd like to thank the Horning Endowment for its support of programming in the history of science, um, which has also supported me for the past decade. Um, I want to thank Environmental Arts and Humanities and Jay Hamblin for their co-sponsorship, the chair of um, the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion, Nicole von Germanton, for her support, and her um, assistant, Suzanne Gifte, for all her help with finances, and last but not least, Natalia Bueno, who does all the background work and makes all these things happen. We're very grateful for that. So let me introduce our keynote speaker today, Professor Lisa Brady, who is Professor of History at Boise State University and outgoing editor, <laughs> she's like, yes, <laughs> of the Journal of Environmental History, which she has led with great distinction over the past several years. Lisa received her PhD from the University of Kansas, where she worked with Donald Worcester, and she's been in Boise since 2003. Um, since the appearance of her first book, War Upon the Land, Military Strategy and the Transformation of Southern Landscapes during the American Civil War, she shifted from um, working mostly on American history to working on the history of Asia, and particularly on the history of Korea and the environmental history of Korea during the Korean War, during and after the Korean War, as we'll see from her talk. I'm really excited to hear Lisa's talk, and I think her work is just great. So I'm really happy to have her here. So let's give a warm welcome to Lisa Brady. Well, I echo Anita's uh, gratitude to all the people who have supported uh, this project and this, this program today. Um, and I especially want to thank Anita and Georgina for inviting me. It is a great honor for me to be here to give the keynote um, to a history of science uh, <laughs> workshop when I am an environmental historian. I am a newbie to uh, some of the more technical aspects of the history of science, um, which I very much um, discovered today, actually. Um, I learned so much. I'm, I'm sorry that this room wasn't as full today um, in, for the earlier sessions as it is tonight, um, because the, the talks today were absolutely fantastic. I learned a great deal. Um, in fact, I would have written a completely different talk had I been to these talks um, already. Uh, I learned that Whiteham Woods is just like the Korean DMZ. <laughs> um, I also knew, uh, learned that pupfish are the keystone species for the 20th century. So, uh, they are going to teach us how to survive. Uh, I learned about uh, Professor Shapley, who I think gives us some fantastic insights Life is tenacious, that is certainly true in the DMZ. Um, the power of reorientation, um, I loved the idea of shifting our perspective, uh, tilting the prism, if you will, of the ways that we look at, look at life, at science, at um, history. And Coal Oil Point, which I actually meant to ask how it changed its name from Pelican Point <laughs> to Coal Oil Point. <laughs> Seems a little strange. Um, but the idea of mythical nature and scientific legitimacy all of these ideas apply to what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Um, I won't be able to integrate them in because, again, I'm, I'm still processing them. I've just learned about them. Um, so my work is now about Korea, the long 20th century in Korea, the history of uh, conflict in Korea, both political and military. Um, but my talk today is going to focus on a particular part of Korea. And I'm going to start with a few images. The first one is this one. Some of you may be familiar with it. The first is this photograph taken from the International Space Station in 2014. Here we see the southern half of the Korean Peninsula shining like a vibrant island of light, while the northern half sort of disappears into the sea. The second image 
a similar image, is a composite one rendered <coughs> from data captured in 2012 by the SOMI NPP satellite. The disparities between the two Koreas appear stark, especially if we look at their capital cities. Seoul stands out like it stands out clear and bright, a veritable sun with satellite cities orbiting its dense core. And here you can see all the different cities around in South, uh, South Korea. Pyongyang, on the other hand, barely registers at all. It's easily confused, had NASA not helpfully labeled it, <laughs> with the fishing vessels that are working the waters all around the Korean Peninsula. So beyond their utility as snapshots of unique moments in time, these images can also serve to illuminate, illuminate deeper historical trends. The division of the peninsula through continued war and ideological conflict is clearly evident in the distribution of light. North Korea's near invisibility in the images mirrors its relationship with the rest of the world. Its darkness is both caused by and evidence of decades of geopolitical isolation. In contrast, South Korea's network of luminescence reflects its interconnectedness, visually linking it to Japan, China, and beyond. Based on these images, there seems to be scant opportunity to bridge what appears to be a gaping chasm between the two nations. But if we zoom in, we may find that what we're looking for, perhaps we can turn the divide here, this is the DMZ, into a bridge. And here is the DMZ. On the ground, this meandering corridor has been many things at one time. A de facto international boundary, an active war zone, a lively tourist destination, and an unofficial nature preserve. This, of course, is the DMZ, the visible, tangible boundary inscribed on Korea's landscape and the emotional political divide embedded in Korean culture. Since 1953, the DMZ has been a physical reminder that peace has not always prevailed on the peninsula. But today, I'd actually like to think about it as something more positive. Its historical and ecological significance may be what it takes to bridge the divide between North and South Korea through shared cultural heritage, mutual admiration for nature, and a common dedication to scientific inquiry. The DMZ, on average, is four kilometers wide, although additional buffer zones on either side broaden its girth by anywhere from four to 16 kilometers. And these borders are generally uh, cleared of forests, as we can see here through burning. These are satellite images um, of burn scars along the DMZ, a portion of the DMZ, the red areas. And in some cases, they are under agricultural cultivation. This is a rather dated image of South Korean farmers um, in Taesongdong, which is uh, a village within, um, it's not actually inside the DMZ itself, but right on the border of the DMZ. Um, and it is uh, a village that existed before the Korean War, and so the villagers there are allowed to remain there and farm because they've got um, historical connection to that area and you can actually buy the rice. It's called DMZ rice, and it comes at a high premium, as you might imagine. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about these, uh, this area. Uh, roughly following the 38th parallel, the DMZ meanders 250 kilometers east from the Han River estuary through the Taebaek Mountains to the East Sea, or the Sea of Japan. It's approximately 1,000 square kilometers, comprise about one half of 1% of the peninsula's total area. It is one of the most heavily landmined and militarized areas on the planet. So how can it be a bridge? How am I seeing this as a place that might actually bring peace and reconciliation to the peninsula? Well, for 65 years, the DMZ has provided largely undisturbed habitat for a wide range of species, including white-naped and red-crowned cranes, these are the red crown cranes shown here in the Chorwan area of um, just north of the DMZ. Amargorals, which are just incredibly cute, I think. <laughs> um, this is a male uh, sort of peeking out from behind the, the rocks there. And wild boar. 
The sign is actually for landmines, but I think the danger sign would also go for the boar. I'm not sure I want to get any closer to it than that. The proliferation of wildlife within the DMZ, both plant and animal, has attracted a great deal of attention since at least the 1990s. As Elena Kim, David Havlick, and others have explained, the DMZ has become a tourist destination, an educational site for those interested in Korea's natural history and ecology. This is where I see the DMZ being a bridge. By its very nature, it becomes a bridge. It has become a rallying cry for those wishing to protect and study what is arguably some of the last wild land left on the, on the peninsula. In 2005, for example, the DMZ Forum, an international US-based 501c3 organization, hosted a conference in Seoul, South Korea, featuring panel discussions and keynote addresses by scientists, politicians, and conservationists, including billionaire philanthropist and CNN founder Ted Turner, all of whom supported some kind of protection for the DMZ and its ecology. This was the fifth such conference sponsored and organized by that group. Previous meetings held in either Seoul or New York City included talks by world-renowned ecologist E.O. Wilson, forest ecologist and peace activist Arthur Westing, and former U.S. Ambassador to South Korea Stephen Bosworth. Across the years, these gatherings consistently centered on the goal of setting aside the DMZ as a nature preserve, an idea that garnered the attention and support of world leaders like former US President Jimmy Carter and the late president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela. The DMZ Forum, founded in 1997 by two Korean Americans, Dr. Song Ho Lee and Dr. Kei Chung Kim, began as an effort to support conservation, and this is a quote from their website, to support conservation of the unique biological and cultural resources of Korea's demilitarized zone, transforming it from a symbol of war and separation to a place of peace among humans and between humans and nature. So the DMZ Forum's founding in 1997 and its early conferences coincided with a thawing of relations between North and South Korea. During the administrations of Kim Dae-jung and Roh moo hyun South Korea instituted a policy of engagement and cooperation with North Korea, which at the time, from 1997 to 2011, was led by Kim Jong-il. The, the Sunshine Policy uh, was in, intended to encourage more, uh, more open diplomatic dialogue and broader economic partnerships between the two nations. The increased level of communication and cooperation between the, the two Koreas facilitated the creation of joint development projects in North Korea, among which were the Mount Kungang Tourist Region, which is on the eastern side of the peninsula, and the Kaesong Industrial Complex, located just 30 miles north of Seoul and just about six miles north of the DMZ. So the industrial complex in particular aimed at strengthening ties between the two nations through mutual economic growth when it was opened in 2004, an economic bridge of sorts. North Korea, pardon me, North Korea received needed infusions of cash through wages, South Korean companies got access to cheap labor, and the South Korean government benefited from an increased tax base on goods produced there. Beyond the financial incentive, the Sunshine Policy and its affiliated projects intended to break down political barriers so that families separated by the Korean War could reunite, if not permanently, then at least more easily and more frequently for brief periods. Together, supporters of the policy anticipated that it would help facilitate diplomatic conversations and negotiations, thus bringing the two Koreas closer to more open borders and potentially to reunification, thus making the DMZ obsolete. So although the cooperative projects garnered general support, some concerns about their broader implications arose especially among those who had watched nature flourish within the confines of the DMZ. Conservation organizations, such as the DMZ Forum, advocated better relations between the two nations, but feared what would, be, what would happen to the flora and fauna and ecosystems that enjoyed some protection inside the DMZ's border should the commercial and industrial developments expand, or in the case of reunification, should the DMZ be completely erased from the map. They had valid reasons for such apprehension. 
both the Kumgang tourist region and the Kaesong industrial complex required major infrastructure projects, ranging from sewer systems to roadways, all of which could potentially compromise the area's environmental integrity. The transportation routes in particular had direct impact on the border region, getting people to the mountain, workers to the plant, and manufactured goods to market necessitated breaching the DMZ, thus fragmenting ecosystems and interrupting migration paths. On a small scale, this presented manageable disruptions to natural processes, but if more widely implemented, should uh, relations between the two Koreas improve, it could spell disaster for some of the last remaining native and wild habitats on the peninsula. That was the fear, at least. Now, beyond the infrastructural <coughs> issues, extensive human activity in the two regions portended environmental degradation as well, including increased pollution and expanded exploitation of natural resources. Some numbers, I hope, will provide some context. Over one million South Koreans, some estimates actually place it closer to two million South Koreans, visited the resort at Mount Kumgong in the decade that it was open, um, between 1998 and 2008. The Kaesong Industrial Complex, at its height, employed 54,000 North Korean workers and around 500 South Korean supervisors. It produced watches, small electronics and textiles, among other consumer goods, and operated continuously for a dozen years, with the exception of a temporary work stoppage in 2013, when North Korea pulled its workers from the factory in opposition to joint South Korean-US military training exercises. The operation generated uh, 2.7 US dollars, or sorry, two, that's not very much. It's not very <laughs> complex, is it? 2.7 billion US dollars, that's a little more like it, um, in trade between the two Koreas in 2015 alone. Now, to put that into perspective, North Korea's entire export value in 2017 was just under 3 billion, so about the same. And that was primarily minerals and agricultural products traded almost exclusively to China. So this was a really big economic boom for North Korea. In early 2016, however, South Korea shut down the facility to protest the North's ballistic missile and nuclear weapons tests. That economic bridge was closed. The closures of Mount Kumgang and the Kaesong Industrial Complex did not assuage environmentalists' fears. If anything, levels of concern rose as the chances for renewed military conflict flared. Diplomatic relations deteriorated under the Lee Myung-bak uh, and Park Geun-hye administrations and became <coughs> even more strained after Kim Jong-un ascended the North to North Korea's supreme leadership upon the death of his father. After several years of belligerent rhetoric and fast-tracking North Korea's nuclear weapons program, Kim Jong-un made a surprising reversal in January 2018. I'm sure you were all aware well of that. Uh, this opened up dialogue with South Korea and intimated that he was willing to both denuclearize the Korean Peninsula and negotiate a final peace. The two nations held a historic inter-Korean summit on April 27, 2018 to discuss the future of the peninsula and signed the Panmunjom Declaration for Peace, Prosperity, and Unification of the Korean Peninsula. What's going to happen with that is still a little bit up in the air. There's all sorts of negotiations still going on, and we can talk about that later if you want. Uh, but to a certain extent, the state of inter-Korean politics, blessed by sunshine or cursed by shadow, changes little but the rhetoric for those who wish to preserve the peninsula's natural heritage. In good times, Nature in the DMZ is portrayed as fragile, susceptible to destruction from unchecked greed and exploitation. In bad times, its environmental health becomes common ground from which pan-Korean cooperation and understanding can grow. In either case, advocates assert the DMZ must be protected. So at this point, I've really only largely hinted at how the DMZ came to be, but that's a very important part of this story. So I'm gonna go into it, a bit of a historical digression here, um, to provide that necessary context. So the history of the DMZ does not begin in 1953, does not begin in 1950 with the start of the Korean War. It actually reaches back into Korea's past as a crossroads of Asia. Sharing borders with China and Russia and separated at its closest point from Japan only by the 120 mile wide Korea or Tsushima Strait, Korea has been the object of expansionist empires for centuries. 
Competition between its larger neighbors made Korea the site of numerous conflicts, including the late 16th century Injin War initiated by Japan, the Manchu or Qing invasions of the early uh, 17th century, and after 200 years of relative peace, the First Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95, and the Russo-Japanese War a decade later. Each of these wars had control over Korea and its resources as a primary aim. These military confrontations had important consequences for Korea politically and economically, especially those later two wars. China's loss in the First Sino-Japanese War paved the way for Japan to exert greater influence on the Korean Peninsula, and Russia's loss in the Russo-Japanese War led directly to Korea's former colonization and annexation by Japan in 1910. I'm going to skip ahead 30 years, although we can talk about the environmental and, and economic and, and cultural uh, impact of Japanese colonization. <coughs> but the end of the Second Sino-Japanese War, which we more familiarly know it as World War II, and of Japan's colonial state, promised a return of peace and self-determination to Korea. However, larger geopolitical forces complicated that transition. New occupiers, the Soviets and the Americans, split the peninsula into temporary zones of authority at the 38th uh, parallel. Simmering ideological divisions among Koreans further undermined political unity, eventually devolving into a brutal war in 1950. By 1953, Korea was shattered, with at least 2 million of its nearly 30 million people dead, military and civilian, millions more displaced and destitute, its rivers degraded and polluted, its farmlands turned into killing fields, and upwards of 65% of its forests destroyed. And that temporary dividing line has then become permanent. That the DMZ exists as a result of vicious conflict enhances its symbolic significance. Were it a remote forest or mountain valley degraded by subsistence farmers desperate for food and fuel, or perhaps a wetland destroyed by corporate or state exploitation, the DMZ would likely have few defenders beyond committed environmentalists and local residents. But because it has the physical, it is the physical manifestation of the Korean people's greatest shared tragedy, and because nature there seems to ignore the ideological competition and the animosity that created it, protecting the DMZ has gained significant support both inside the Koreas and beyond. The divide has now become, I would argue, a potential bridge. To understand why, I think we need to know a little bit more about what makes the DMZ special. Although today it is unique in its environmental makeup, such has not always been the case. Prior to becoming a politically significant region in the mid 20th century, the area along the 38th parallel was historically and environmentally unremarkable, except for being the narrowest part of the peninsula. It shared geological, ecological, and climatological characteristics with many other regions across Korea. It is in this similarity to other areas of the peninsula, however, where it derives its importance for scientific and conservation perspectives. <laughs> Providing an overview of Korea's physical environment will help to make this point more clearly. Mountains cover the eastern two-thirds of the peninsula, and here is a satellite image. Um, you can see here all of this area is mountainous. Um, snow covering the highest heights here. And this is um, a north to south rendering of the elevations of Korea. So you can see this is Mount Pikdu here. That is right there. Um, and uh, Mount Hala, you can't actually see. It would be right down around here on uh, Jeju Island. But this is, again, the north to south. So it's going from here south, just to give you a sense of the um, changes in elevation. Throughout the Taebaksan range, and that would be going along here, that runs like a spine north to south, gneiss and granite comprise the basement rock with significant overlays of sedimentary rock deposited over millions of years as sea levels rose and fell. The remainder of the peninsula, that is the western third, consists generally of flat plains, and here you can see around Pyongyang, um, all along this area in North Korea, and South Korea, it looks a little bit more mountainous, but there are uh, a number of uh, lower valleys where agriculture can actually be uh, practiced quite successfully. Uh, the western third consists generally of flat plains traversed by rivers that typically flow westward to empty into the Yellow Sea. It's over here. 
Um, although some smaller streams, mostly in the north, do empty into the East Sea here. Korea's geological and hydrological characteristics, in combination with its monsoonal climate, leave it highly susceptible to erosion, especially where forest and other types of vegetative cover are thin. Biologically, Korea is fairly diverse, with over 41,400 species officially recorded, including at least 2,200 native species, some unique to the peninsula, and others that can be found in the wider East Asian region. Now, these are representative pictures. Not all of these are actually from Korea, but they do represent um, some of the wildlife and some of the species that are there. Um, the Siberian or Amur tiger, which is actually extinct on the peninsula, except um, there, some people there are, um, they claim that there has been a return of these tigers, that they found spore and um, evidence that Korea has, or that tigers have returned to Korea. Um, that has yet to be verified. Uh, this is the Asiatic uh, black bear. Um, this is a water deer. And the um, Amur uh, leopard cat, sorry. Um, I couldn't find a really good picture of an otter. Um, so here's a wonderful picture of uh, Korean South Korean commemorative stamps of the otter. Um, and the, uh, this is the white naped crane here. Uh, historically, Korea's fauna included approximately 100 mam mammal species. That's very difficult to say. Mammal species, there we go, such as the Asiatic black bear, the amur leopard, uh, and the Siberian tiger. Most of its larger mammals, especially predator species, are now rare, endangered, or extinct due to habitat loss or overhunting. Smaller mammals include the amur or long tailed goral, which I introduced to you before, wild boars water deer, and the leopard cat. The peninsula is also home to a variety of riverine and marine mammals, such as otters, sea lions, and dolphins, and to small terrestrial creatures, such as hares, voles, and bats. Birds are also prominent members of Korea's animal life, with at least 500 species, ranging from herons and kestrels and owls to the white-naped and red-crowned cranes. I, I won't go into all of the rest of the species that I have listed here. That would take a lot more time than I think I have. But it's really very, very biologically diverse. I'll answer questions if you want at the end. Um, humans, of course, also claim a prominent role in Korea's geological and ecological history. Hominin remains dating to at least 46,000 years ago have been found in Yonggok Cave near Pyongyang, with agricultural sites dating from between 10,000 and 8,000 years ago. Human changes to Korea's landscape have taken multiple forms, from terracing of hillsides for agriculture or erosion control, to damming of rivers for irrigation and hydroelectric use. Urbanization and industrialization since the 1960s have also taken their toll, ramping up pollution, resource extraction, and habitat destruction, and restructuring the physical landscape through rerouting streams, digging out mines and mountains, and covering vast areas of land with roads and high rises. By far, the most extensive changes have been to Korea's forests, which largely coincide with its mountains. As the main source for building materials and fuel, forests have long been under significant pressure. They remain among the peninsula's most important natural resource and continue to face overexploitation with serious implications for biodiversity and erosion control. Now that's a very broad description of the peninsula's environment, which admittedly elides regional uh, variations that affected the evolution of Korea's culture, society, and ecology over the past several millennia. Um, but I think it provides a useful baseline from which, <clears throat> excuse me, to begin discussion of the DMZ and why it is now the focus of conservation efforts. Importantly, the DMZ represents a visually, uh, sorry, a virtually complete cross session of the peninsula's geology and ecology. Like the rest of Korea, the DMZ is predominantly mountainous, with its eastern reaches characterized by steep, rugged peaks of highly eroded, uh, weathered bedrock and eroded slopes. Scores of rivers and streams wend their way through the zone, depositing silt and watering wetlands as they flow west to the sea. The western terminus of the DMZ runs through the Han River estuary, where the still disputed northern limit line extends into the Yellow Sea, serving as the maritime boundary between the two Koreas. Its forests, marshes, grasslands, and waterways provide food and habitat to a wide variety of flora and fauna within and outside of its borders. 
It is important to understand that DMZ's current ecology does not conform to ecological conditions on the peninsula prior to human habitation, nor does it reflect the state of nature just prior to the war that created this strange nature preserve. That, it, that is, it is not some kind of primordial place where we can see Korea's untouched natural history, although that is among the claims um, of some of its uh, promoters. Before the DMZ became a line on a map, before it became home to rare species of plants and animals, it supported farmers and villagers who grew crops from its soil, took fish and fresh water from its rivers, and collected firewood and building materials from its forests. Its resources protect, uh, provided sustenance for generations of people who altered, managed, and at times overexploited the region's natural systems. Three years of war destroyed these long-term interactions between people and nature and the ecologies that such exchanges created. First, through near total devastation of the area's physical and cultural landscapes, and then by excluding all but military personnel from its newly drawn boundaries. Acknowledging as much does not undermine the value of the DMZ from an ecological standpoint. Instead, recognizing the unique quality and history of its nature offers researchers and policymakers crucial insights into the variety of ecological and cultural values the DMZ can provide. One of the major lessons I think the DMZ can teach us is that nature is resilient. Ecosystems and species can be fragile, even threatened or destroyed by the slightest changes in temperature, uh, precipitation, biodiversity levels, or habitat loss. But nature, the physical and biological world we have come to define as not human, adjusts, adapts, and evolves. What persists after such changes may or may not resemble what we find familiar, and may or may not be what we value, but it remains nature nevertheless. In the case of the Korean demilitarized zone, nature has both real and symbolic worth to Koreans on both sides of the line, as well as to a global community that embraces environmentalist philosophies and appreciates what nature can teach us through science and other forms of knowledge and understanding. So as early as 1995, researchers began formal surveys of the biota in the DMZ corridor, which at that time did not include the actual DMZ itself, but the uh, northern and southern border areas instead, documenting the thousands of plants, animals, and in insect species. Um, they, the studies and projects took place in the analogous buffer zones that, as I've just mentioned, um, both north and south with the International Crane Foundation's Red Crowned and White Naped Crane Migratory Reserve Project in Chorwon on the north as the best example of northern science taking place. There are also a small number of sites where ecological studies have been conducted within the DMZ, specifically near the Panmunjom Joint Security Area and along the Kaesong Industrial Complex train line, and again in Chorwon County, which is where uh, the Red Crown Crane Foundation has, or sorry, the International Crane Foundation has its uh, study area. Among the first time scientists were allowed into the DMZ was during construction of the highway and railroad servicing the Kaesong Industrial Complex. These infrastructure projects provided a much anticipated opportunity to do field research and find out what actually existed in between the razor wire fences. Among these scientists was Quigong Kim, professor of planning and author of a book called The Demilitarized Zone of Korea. This is a really fantastic resource for anyone interested in um, knowing what science has been done, um, just ecological surveys, the geological surveys, all of the things, um, all the science that has been done inside the DMZ. According to Kim, uh, researchers have identified around 2,000 species of plants and animals which he estimates to be approximately two-thirds of the total number that likely exist in the DMZ region. He notes, however, that at only about 10% of the species in the DMZ have been formally documented. Among the species documented in the research areas, over two dozen are legally protected by various South Korean governmental agencies, and some are listed on the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. So, there is a great deal of interest in protecting these species, in, this, in protecting this ecosystem. But the questions arise, what can a protected DMZ do? Who or what might it benefit? 
what concerns are associated with the creation of a bilateral, multilateral, or UN-supported conservation area between the two Koreas. What would happen if the Korean War officially ends and a unified nation is once again restored to the peninsula? These are among the many questions supporters and opponents of turning the DMZ into a nature reserve ask as they look toward the future. And I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking a little bit about some of the plans that people have proposed for the DMZ as a nature preserve. So since at least the early 90s, various entities within and outside of uh, Korea have clamored for the DMZ to not only more closely re uh, resemble its name, demilitarized, rather than its character, heavily armed and guarded, but also to become both a symbol of and first step toward inter-Korean reconciliation and reunification. Prominent among such calls are suggestions for turning to nature as common ground. The underlying premise is that, uh, that mutual respect for the natural environment, as well as shared understanding that healthy ecosystems benefit human communities, could override the ideological impasse that has dominated the peninsula since before the Korean War. This turn toward nature as a neutral arbiter between the two Koreas has resulted in a variety of proposals, many of which revolve around turning the DMZ into some kind of transboundary peace park. Large-scale military operations are among the greatest challenges to creating such a park in the DMZ. Such exercises have taken place within or near the DMZ and civilian control zone, which is the southern border region, um, on land and in the Yellow Sea every year since 1953, when the armistice was signed. South Korea conducts its joint military training exercises with the United States every spring. Without fail, North Korea characterizes these activities as hostile to its security, despite its own winter military training exercises. North Korea often threatens to retaliate with great show of force. These North Korean threats, which have included warnings of nuclear attack, have yet to become direct action, with the possible exception of the Chonan incident of March 26, 2010, in which 46 South Korean sailors died when their vessel sank in the Yellow Sea after being, what, uh, after being hit by what appears to have been a North Korean torpedo. Now, North Korea denies any involvement in that. There are less dramatic but equally critical obstacles to the possibility of a park in the DMZ. As Charles Chester notes in Conservation Across Borders, transboundary protection areas raise the thorny issue of prioritizing wildlife and ecosystems over human health and subsistence. This is especially true when those living in or around a potential nature protection area suffer from low standards of living, food insecurity, resource scarcity, or other deprivations. Such is the case on the Korean Peninsula. While wealth and health indicators are relatively high in South Korea, they are among the lowest in the world in North Korea. According to the CIA World Factbook from 2017, South Korea and North Korea rank, respectively, 14th and 115th in comparative GDP, and 45th and 211th per capita in per capita GDP. Uh, to give that a little bit of um, specificity, uh, this, the fact book notes that the uh, per capita income for South Koreans is at 39,400 US dollars annually, and in uh, North Korea it is at 1,700 dollars US per capita. While these data can be revealing, they do not tell the whole story. Between the mid-1990s and 2009, North Korea suffered terrible famine, resulting in an estimated 330,000 deaths due to a series of droughts and floods, general economic mismanagement, and a critical reduction in aid after the demise of the Soviet Union. Setting aside land for nature seems to fly in the face of humanitarian need. Although many transboundary conservation areas have proven effective from both ecological and political standpoints, transforming the DMZ from a war zone into an eco-park poses a number of problems. One of these simply is where to begin. Ending the war and either establishing diplomatic relations between the two Koreas or reuniting them into one nation may seem the logical starting point. But according to Arthur Westing, who has written extensively on transboundary parks, and on, the and, and on the potential for one in the DMZ, setting aside the region in whole or part, and I'm quoting him here, would certainly be best accomplished before such time that a treaty is adopted. 
Westing's concern is that without a prior arrangement to protect ecosystems and species in the DMZ, development, agricultural, industrial, commercial, and urban would quickly encroach and likely eliminate the area's environmental health and value. Yet another obstacle to peace in the DMZ is a historical lack of commitment to nature preservation on the peninsula. Depending on the source and variables included, protected areas comprise only three to six percent of the peninsula's entire territory. So from the standpoint of those who lived through the war that created the DMZ, <coughs> and for those that still have family on the other side of its borders, the region serves as a painful reminder of what was lost. Communities <coughs> divided by politics and war, farmland transformed into minefields, rivers, forests, and mountains made inaccessible for subsistence and recreation. But for some, it also represents hope for the future. Because its land and natural resources have not been developed, the DMZ has become a sort of storehouse for flora and fauna that have no viable habitat elsewhere <coughs> on the peninsula. Those who advocate for its preservation do so with careful respect for those who wish to see a single Korea and who view the DMZ as a physical manifestation of the socio-political obstacles to that goal. <coughs> Rather than dismiss those concerns out of hand, DMZ preservation activists view the cultural and ecological importance of the border as mutually constitutive. Protecting the DMZ's natural systems would honor the long-held connections between the Korean people and their environment, while also providing a place to interpret and commemorate a tragic period in their history. According to Sung Ho Lee, president of the DMZ Forum, natural and historic landscapes within the DMZ require protection, including <coughs> ancient and pre-modern historical sites, battlegrounds from the Korean War, and other as yet undiscovered sites of, Korea, of cultural importance. In undertaking such protective action, Lee believes that the political tensions in the region would be ameliorated, stating, and I quote him here, collaborative efforts to turn Korea's demilitarized zone into a UNESCO World Heritage Site can serve as a trust-building measure. Thus, in both material and symbolic forms, the DMZ reifies the discontinuities between North and South that we saw in those earlier satellite images, but in very important ways may also serve as a bridge, a place that commemorates the human sacrifices of military conflict, a site that protects a variety of ecosystems and species that are found nowhere else on the peninsula, and that bridge that may close the divide between North and South Korea. Thank you very much.